8강에 어렵게 합류하게 됐는데 8강에서 좀 C9을 만나게 됐거든요 C9이 이번 그룹에서 좀 뭐라 해야 될까 퍼포먼스가 정말 좋았어요 마지막에 2라운드 때 그래서 너무 무섭고 We show up in groups in a big way and going into quarters I think this is the best chance that I've ever had I think you should be really excited about Cloud9. Cloud9 passed the group of death and qualified for the quarterfinals. C9은 이제 저희한테 지면 아예 분무시드가 없어지는 건데 그냥 서로 서로 이렇게 사명감을 안고 할것 같아서 되게 재밌는 경기를 할것 같아요. 지금까지 진행되었던 롤드컵은 되게. 강력한 우승 후보가 있었잖아요. 네, 이번 월드컵은 많이 다른 것 같아요. 모든 팀이 지금 다 우승권에 있다고 생각하거든요. I feel like some people are overestimating how close the teams really are. I think that we will see how close it actually is. They got a second kill already. I see you're going to be wiped off of the map. And Fnatic will take the number one seed into the quarterfinal. I believe the gap is closed, and now is the time for us to step up. Welcome back. It's World's Countdown, a freak of freaks and Cloud9 clash in about 12 and a half minutes. Yesterday, we saw the importance of sticking to your style with G2 finding huge success in their 1-3-1. So let's check out how the teams on stage today find their wins, starting with another EU powerhouse in Fnatic. And we kind of decided to label this team the Boxer, just because of their willingness to throw out a punch for every time they take one. They're a team that gets scrappy, they're a team that gets in the thick of things, and they will match anything that you try to throw. And for me, it's also this aspect of endurance. The fact that they will not only go toe for toe, but even when you push them to that back foot, when Invictus Gaming did get the better of Fnatic, late game, they were still pulling out these clutch plays, you know, so as charging into the Baron, trying to save the day for Fnatic. So it's not really over until their next actually goes down. A lot of grit and willingness to fight out of that squad. They're going up against EDG. Let's talk about them and their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, EDG is very much a double-edged sword. We see the very close games they had against Mad Team, and then we saw them steamroll KT Rolster in another. So they do take a lot of risk. They don't necessarily have the best fight setup, but some of them are so good individually that it is hit or miss on seemingly every occasion. And if the meta continues to be this really heavy, down and dirty skirmish style, suddenly Edward Gaming don't look so blown out across from Fnatic. You know, there is a chance that if we're going to go blow for blow, that that sucker punch can just find them in the right hook from Edward Gaming. I right, like their chances a bit when it comes to that stylistic matchup. Let's talk about the first series at hand, though, today. A freak of freaks, the last hope for Korea. I consider this team the controlled, calculated, almost classic Korean style, given that they don't like to try and snowball. They don't like to get down and dirty. They like to sit above the other teams and look down at the mess they're creating, and they pick the right moment to come in and involve themselves in the fight. As Styles dying, though, this World Championship in a freak of freaks, combined kills per minute wise, 0.4, which is by far the, few, the lowest in groups. They have the fewest deaths of teams in group stage, and actually the third fewest kills as well. It does speak to the control. They keep their games very much about turret pushing, fight avoidance, and forcing the other team to take risks. It's going to be interesting to see then how Cloud9 chooses to interact with that in action, essentially, as they've been one of our most innovative teams here at the World Championship. Is it going to be the Zillion? Is it going to be the Hecarim? Is it going to be the Singe? We don't know the depth of Cloud9's champion pool or the depths of their tricks. A lot of crap credit to Reaper because it's not just about the five-man roster on the field, it's about the six-man roster behind this NA org. Yeah, and I always say during the NALCS, Reaper is the hardest coach to predict in draft because it doesn't feel like he actually has that many tendencies. Even uh, when they pull out the Hecarim, they did it in the regional qualifier, then saved it all the way until the last day of the group stage for Licorice. So uh, not only do they have innovative picks, they're fairly innovative in the styles they play because they do switch them up in between games. Of course, in a best of five, there will be questions raised, as you mentioned, about how deep that pool is, how far down the innovation, you know, whole rabbit hole can they go before they run out of options. Now, Cloud9's journey of innovation was an emotional day for the North American org, as we see in this week's mic check. I mean, I'll play Danish if that was Danish. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <gasps> yeah? 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 Yeah. This is the stupidest conversation <laughs> I've ever had. All right, so... Look, look, look. Ready? Ooh. Oh, my God. Yo, sneak in, say These guys play like maniacs. Psychopaths. 
What's up, Sneaky? Can you turn up myself? Like my own feedback? Hey. Yeah. One second. Sneaky needs to. Not, not play too much. Oh, dumb he sneaky sounds. hears too many idiots in comms. He's like, ah, oh, finally. <laughs> no, I turned myself up. Myself. I can hear some smart comms. <laughs> And then they have to back out. Let's step up. Okay. I'm opting him. I'm opting him. Okay, he's Jonathan. In. Jonathan, kill Sneaky. I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Hold on this. Hold on. Sonya, Sonya, on their AD. On their AD. I'm ulting on. Ulting on. I, I have LeBlanc here. LeBlanc's LeBlanc here. LeBlanc's dead. Hey, we're just in. Just in. We're just in. Don't chase him. Don't chase him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, fine. Fine. Nice job, guys. Uh, nice. Job. Holy yeah. shit. <laughs> okay. Tony here. Yeah. Walk him. I'm on him. We can probably kill him. here. Yeah. No flash. Nice job. 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 I have wall on him. I got kill flash, I got kill flash. Watch Cyan, kill flash. Hit front, hit front, hit front. Hit front, hit front. Kaisa, 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 I'm just hitting Nexus. Oh, we're hitting Kill Ball. We hit the end. We are Good job, boys. Yeah. Nice shot, boys. We're going to need some high energy as well. Yep. I'm starting the game. No! Nice. Nice. Nice shot, Dennis. Give me Hecarim. All right, so go for a confidence <laughs> one. Hell yeah. So let's go, hell yeah. All right, let's go, Eric. I won't try. Flash, another flash. I'm just running for mission. I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. I'm on Syndra, I'm on Syndra. Okay. Uh, you run, guys, you run. Syndra's dead, Syndra's dead, Syndra's dead. Nice. Dead. Yeah. Mid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and hitting the mid wave. All right, I use multi, but it's fine. Nice shot, guys. Nice. What's the draft? Oh, uh, it's going to be random. Random draft. <laughs> Cloud9 loading up against the Freak of Freaks in not too long. The LCK's last hope in the tournament. I want to talk about this squad because even pre-tournament, they were known as the prep squad, the one that with mm -hmm. enough time would come in with a good plan of how to dismantle any team they're going up against. Of course, we've had a truncated amount of time between groups and knockouts this year around, as well as the fact that nothing this year seems to be going as expected. I know, it feels like like the bat signal went off and you're waiting for Genji or SKT, KT, Rolster, Griffin, someone's gonna save the day and out rolls Robin with the Afrika Freaks. <laughs> and the thing is, is while they're such a disciplined team and they have so much depth to their champion pool, it again goes back to this matchup across from Cloud9 with so many different innovative picks. You know, we say what more left in the tank for Cloud9, what more is left in the tank for Afrika? How much have they actually been able to change things up? The thing for Afrika that I'm looking at is their consistency coming into this game because I think that when you look at how their year has gone, this has been the most successful year mm -hmm. in the organization's history. Before this year, it was fifth place, fifth place, fifth place, fifth place. And then with the introduction of Keen, they found themselves in their first ever final. They made it to third place last split. And a lot of that was due to the infrastructure and that they always came in with a plan. And they were able to execute upon it. And in the second round Robin of Group A is when we started to see a return to form of that kind of Afrika. And I felt like a lot of that was due to Spirit. You know, after Mowgli got subbed in, Spirit returned for a second round Robin. He picked up the no Nocturne pick across from Flash Wolves, and suddenly it looked like a very different meta read from Afrika. Yeah, what I am really curious to see in this series is uh, what they've actually adapted in the time off before the quarterfinals because uh, the difference between first week of Frika and second week of Frika was huge. I actually feel like in first week, they were trying to be adaptive and say, okay, we're going to be able to pull out the Akali in the top lane. You'll split push with that. and Or we'll do a team fighting comp with Scion. But those failed. And in the consistent day that, you know, they adapted to, they really just went back to their bread and butter, which was a slow controlled game with a late scaling split push top laner and they 4-1. So the question will be, do they just run that as many times as possible? Or do they actually have something new that could surprise Cloud9? Well, and as we saw yesterday, adaptation within series is just as important as the adaptation between the stages. Yeah. Because, you know, we're watching all of a sudden Aatrox go through a pick ban, you know, where it was 100% from, you know, to up to that point. And so, again, I'll have questions about Afrika's willingness to make those kind of, you know, in the moment adaptations. And who's gonna show up in the moment on the day? Because while Afrika did have a good turnaround from week two, you know, it was a, a compressed amount of time. That could have just been that on that day, Afrika were just playing very well and then they go back to their previous performance of the other two days. Now on the other side of the matchup, we've got Cloud9. They're looking to continue their Great Worlds run by securing a semi-final spot. 
man, Cloud9, 10th place at one point in the summer split, makes it into playing, go all the way through playing, escape the group of death. They make their fifth quarterfinal in sixth years and are now looking for their first semifinal appearance against the last hope from Korea. I, I love the fact that this is NA's last team against Korea's, Korea's last, last team. team. And if NA wins, they actually outlast Korea at a world championship. And, and I do love the combination of rookies and veterans that this squad has developed because recently we've been seeing a lot more reliance of Svenskeren over Blabber. And while admittedly Blabber didn't have the best play-ins performance, mm -hmm. it, we did see a lot of growth throughout the tournament for him. But now they're relying on Svenskeren, combining him with the rookies of Licorice and Zazel. And you seem to have this mesh of a squad that seems to really know what they're doing when they come into these big games. You mentioned one of the rookies, but with the game just a few minutes away, I want to go down the map lane by lane and talk about where these teams have found an advantage as we did just yesterday. And we went back and forth over this one, but ultimately based on tournament performance right now, Licorice is right. the better top laner. And this is huge because Keen was ranked four on top 20. Absolutely. I think so many of these choices are actually incredibly close. The bot lane checks both going to the Afrika Freaks. I mean, when you look at the group stage statistics, they have had actually much better laning than the C9 bot lane, but that doesn't mean that Zaza won't be able to make plays or Sneaky won't be able to have a clutch late game team fight. These are much closer than the checkmark scorecard we did yesterday between KT and IG. I think it's really matchup dependent, especially for that bot lane, but I think that something that was actually close was the difference between Jensen and Kuro. And that's before we even get to the topic of intangibles, right? We've mm -hmm. talked about the lanes in their isolation, but there are many things like Cloud9's innovation and or Afrika's prep that need to be taken into account. Yeah, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about that dash because one of the big innovations that we see from Cloud9 is this use of the Zillion and the Shen. And I think that it fits very nicely in how they like to play, in the way in which they love to be aggressive, they try to force a lot of fights and skirmishes in the early game, and champions like Zillion in particular give you that extra bit of revival power. You know, they bring you back when things are looking pretty dire. This is a fantastic example against Vitality where it looks Looks like this fight should have gone in Vitality's way, but again, the use of the Zillion ult really benefits them. The problem is it sometimes compensates for some of the mistakes that we see from Cloud9, where a lot of individual members overstep. They aren't aware of what's going on in the map. And if we just look at this one, where Sven Skarin is trying to kill out a ward, he should have died here. But because of things like the Zillion ult, these mistakes are compensated for. So, again, we'll be looking for one, what happens when those things are taken mm -hmm. off the table and how does C9 interact? And then has Afrika even identified these things and learned how to play around them or maybe punish C9 for their tendencies? Throughout Worlds 2018, though, we've learned that you should expect the unexpected. And, <laughs> and with that in mind, no matter how unlikely upsets may be or even at this point, the expected may be, I want to see how it translates into today's prediction. So down the line, starting in our first series, Afrika versus Cloud9. Frosker, and who are you taking? I don't think Lightning's going to strike three times in a row, although who knows. I'm going to go Afrika 3-1. I just think the adaptation, the turnaround time, the fact that Afrika have a lot of experience with Cloud9, I think that we'll be able to see something crazy in the draft, and we'll go back to that controlled style. A 3-1 for the LCK. Vedius, what are you thinking? I'm in agreement with Frosk. 3-1 Afrika for me. I have to go with what my analytical brain says. I feel like Cloud9 have a little too much over-reliance on some of these specific picks, and I feel like Afrika will come in prepared. Yeah, that was your first mistake, going with your analytical <laughs> brain. I mean, were you watching? Watching yesterday, like G2, IG, I think you have to expect a little bit of unexpected stuff. Uh, I'm hoping that this is the year C9 breaks through to semifinals. I'm going to go uh, C9, 3-2. They have something new in the bank. Afrika might not be able to play anything but that top lane style with Keen. And if Licorice can match him in the 1v1, Cloud9 can take the series. Jazz says we're going the distance. We'll see if Afrika has anything to say about that, and we'll see which teams deliver for the region as we send it off to Freak, Papa Smithy, and Kobe for game one. Thank you very much, Dash. Welcome to the first series of the day. My name is David Freak Chirley. I'm joined on the far side by Chris Papa Smithy Smith and Sam Kobe Hartman Kensler in the middle. The opening ceremony will be coming up very soon to introduce these teams onto stage after hearing the analyst desk a bit split. Who's going to win? What are we thinking today? That's a tricky one. I imagine we have different allegiances here, but I just want to see a good game. And I, as the, at the desk is talking about, the adaptation here will be the most interesting thing. Honestly, I'm just so excited for this series and even just the pick and ban. Mm -hmm. These are two of the most hyped coaching staffs in the entire sure. world. 
Reaper for Cloud9, and the multiple. <laughs> we got three, baby. <laughs> multiple coaches. That's here what it's all about. For uh, for Afrika, not quite sure which one's actually on stage, but so much work and preparation has been put in by both of these teams. And as they were talking about it on the desk, I am a hundred percent sure that both of these teams have something new. I can't yep. wait to see what it is. And it's exciting for me as well because it is a lot of the eyes for me on Keen versus Licorice in that top lane matchup. Keen coming in as the number four player in the world's top 20 list. He was the reason that Afrika went from a fifth place finishing team that could never win a playoff series to a silver medal in spring and a bronze medal uh, in summer. Now here at Worlds, like this man is incredible. He's played one tank all of Worlds. <laughs> is my favorite kind of top laner to watch. He's up against Licorice, though, a, a year rookie himself, and it's going to be super exciting. And I love that you mentioned the medals because, of course, Asia Games as well. He was a silver medalist on the Korean national team, was voted in as a Korean national top laner. So a lot of hype for a player that played half of summer season last year. So at the end of the day, not technically a rookie, but his rookie status compared to, say, Licorice, who played all that time in Challenger, pretty much equivalent and the hype levels are right up there for both it's been another one of the great stories this year the success of all these young players and now we introduce them on the stage cloud nine of course as we heard on the analyst desk during the countdown five of six times they've gone to worlds they have made it into the quarterfinals Licorice there, the top laner. Rookie of the split in spring split. All LCS top laner at the end of the year. And then on the other side, of course, it is the Afrika Freaks. They will be starting with Spirit in game one. No surprise there. Definitely some veterancy about this lineup. And Kuro are returning world's finalist and world's semi-finalist in past years. So player by player, Licorice there in the top lane, of course, has been truly impressive. You saw the AD give him the nod as the better performing top laner so far this tournament. Uh, of course, his opponent, Keen, truly incredible. You expect for history, Keen would win this matchup. But as we've seen throughout Worlds, performance on the day is what matters more. And as we've seen in the groups leading up to today, as well as the games today, this morning, is that these solo laner performances have been incredibly important with the way that the current meta has changed. And it's really fun to see that sometimes role by role you have fun stories like Sven Skeren and Spirit having very long candidacies as players playing in multiple regions as well. In the mid lane, same story there when it comes to experience. Jensen, of course, been around now for multiple years. He still feels like a newer player to me because I remember the days of wanting to see Jensen actually come into professional play. But that's many years ago now and we have two veterans in that mid. Kuro's been one of my favorite mid laners for a very long time as well. This guy gets almost no resources, yet is the second carry for the team statistically in terms of damage and kills and everything else. He's really, really good. And he was a big part of uh, when people talk about the flexibility of Afrika Freaks and the different champions, you know, the Velkaz coming out super early uh, and being able to play multiple styles for the team. Kramer kind of a forgotten world's appearance on the flash rolls now a few years ago. Played only that single game, and L was preferred in that tournament, but is technically a returning world's player next to his mid laner in court. Another rookie there, Zazel, brought on to Cloud9 specifically for his communication but also showing up with his mechanics. And Tucson has been playing for an incredibly long time, actually. He's been another one of those players who's been on Afrika for two years, spent a long time in Incredible Miracle before then, and finally getting some good results for himself here at Worlds. He's uh, definitely a great player. And even had that gap here as well. So definitely one to look for, though. Runner-up in the spring season MVP rankings. <laughs> Once again, back on stage, players setting up, getting ready to go into this one. Cloud9, the second seed coming into this quarterfinal match. I should say lower seed, second place in their group stage. And I think that is the man who needs to show up the most today. Licorice, a rookie this year, 
has been truly incredible. Mostly a carry only player, but at Worlds playing a lot of tanks, being hard engage. He's up against Keen, arguably the best top laner in the world, and that is going to be an incredible matchup to watch for. Definitely. This is the sort of game where if you argued for that locked cam top lane, it'd be hard to disagree. And yet, maybe the game will be about the other four parts of the map rather than just about the top. I feel like it will go hard one way or the other. I don't expect that to evolve. I think there really will be a big emphasis on one or the other. We definitely need to get into the picks for these two teams because, of course, there have been iconic ones already this year. Yep. Zillion is one of the first champions that Cloud9 used to dig themselves out of 10th place in the North American LCS Summer Split. And Cloud9 have definitely made one thing clear. Ever since, I believe, the third game of that play-ins final, they have banned Tom Kench on blue side and red side every game. They don't miss a trick with that here, and they will actually ban the Akali on blue side as well. We have 11 Tom Kench bans in a row for Cloud9. We'll see if that continues on throughout this series, as uh, I'm really not surprised by almost any of the Afrika bans as well. The Zillion and Nocturne choice bans against Cloud9's preferred play style, and Jensen's arguably best mid laner, but now my first pick, Aatrox, is allowed for Licorice. Yeah, and we expect Licorice to hold on to it, even though it's traditionally very flexible between the mid lane. Uh, it's almost always gone to Licorice for Cloud9. And if we don't see a first round top laner, Will we see Keen with one of his homebrew answers to the Aatrox? Usually, it's Cloud9 that has those. Of course, the Hecarim, very famous. Even the Poppy is one they've played. When it comes to Keen, and you think of quintessential Keen champions, the Swift pushes like the Jax, he also loves the Darius, who we haven't seen this tournament. Tricky matchup for the Darius, but given the player, an outside possibility. It definitely will say a lot about the game plan for Afrika Freaks depending on which route they go. If they go the Poppy, having that standard tank for the front line, trying to play front to back. Um, but as you say, they very well could go for a more punishing 1v1 and try and win the split. I would expect to see Keen on a 1v1 champion up in that top lane. Sin Zhao to be locked in for Sven Skaren and Cloud9 have to decide if they want some other high priority champions. Kaisa and Zaya, two big ones up there. We know one of the support's been taken off the table. That could be an easy pinch for Afrika in the second ban phase. I want to point to something that's unlikely to come out, but given Afrika's reputation should be thought of, you look at Afrika's draft and say, okay, you're not going to be flexing this Gragas, you've already taken Alistair. Gragas' top was meta for a while, going for a very armor-centric build, something like an Iceborne Gauntlet. There is always the outside chance you go for a big fake out here and go for a very late jungler or top laner, depending on the scenario. The only drawback for Afrika Freaks is that their single game, Freak was mentioning, with the tank, the Scion, was probably their worst game. Uh, the worst performance from Keen himself. So maybe they will divert from this route. Second round of band phase will come in, and the Marksman has not been matched. This is huge because Afrika Freeze can dump more bands into Sneaky, who has struggled in the group stage as far as the laning phase does go. And we've definitely largely seen him just grab Kaisa and try to make it work one way or the other. His Kaisa win rate is very high. Notably, hasn't taken it in the first round. Afrika Freaks are wanting this game to go long based on how they've played so far at this tournament. Cloud9 might want Kaisa as late game insurance, saying, okay, if it's a very low kill farming early game, showing up with a three item Kaisa, you feel pretty good. Well, one of the big things about Cloud9 has been their mid lane here, and you're seeing Afrika ban away some of the blind mids that could be safe, like Rise and Cloud9 trying to set up what the counterpick would be with their Galio ban. Yeah, as far as more mid lane co bans come through, we should also go over the possible counters that have already been picked up. Uh, let's explain Cloud9's Braum pick here at the end of uh, phase two in response to the Gragas. The unbreakable shield from Braum does a very good job at denying some of the big playmaking from Gragas. You can pop the ultimate in the air to stop that big team fight utility. And he even holds the feathers back and stops that from the root caller. And given, of course, Sneaky's struggle against Zaya earlier in this tournament against Uzi, anything you can do to help out, very much appreciated. And this looks like a little Blanc setup for Cloud9 right now with the Galio and Lissandra bands. That's the setup it looks like for me. So does Kuro blind it first, seeing the bands come through, and then make uh, actually Jensen react here? And that's just, a, I think, a smart reaction to what the bands would be. But oh. no, they give him safe wave clear. Victor, to me, is like the quintessential Kuro yeah. champion. 
put him on a damage mage, you're gonna wave clear forever. Before there was Crown, there was Kuro, who was that big Victor player, but he hasn't really played it recently. LeBlanc can be opted into in this lane as well. Already starting out with some Vintage Rocks Tiger yeah. Kuro yeah. here showing up on the world stage, and now it is time for Cloud9 to answer with a lane dominant AD Gary Big for Sneaky himself. Brahmin Lucian classic combination going for early stuns. You can quickly proc the passive and possibly go for those kills early. And that LeBlanc is being hovered here. So despite the fact that we have had zero bot lane marks been banned, it is Zaya versus Lucian in the bottom lane. And whoa, that is a Cassidy coming through. So Victor flexing top, Cassidy fighting LeBlanc. And that is Greg out in the jungle. They got him with the little flash of the LeBlanc there. Bit of a bait, bit of a challenge. And now we're gonna see Keen on his mage in the top side can absolutely outrange this Aatrox and harass him. Come on, Kobe, this bait is master tier on this team. We wondered about the Gragas flex, but no, the victor is actually the bait. And this is gonna try to farm it out, like you mentioned, against the Aatrox. Huge, huge switch here from Afrika Freaks, as expected. The, the hidden picks already coming out. So let's see what they do with the double mages, though, because uh, this is going to be very important how their bottom lane does do. If Kramer isn't a factor, then it will become much more difficult. And going to Freak's point earlier about what changed this year, bringing in Keen and Licorice coming in, remember that the coaching staff of Afrika changed this year as well. Quintessential fifth place team, Comet joins Zephyr, the drafting coach of the Korean national team. They both join and the results go way up. And that is also something that needs to be remembered and it's being reflected in this first best of five draft. Well, Victor up in the top lane versus Aatrox. I love pocket pick counter picks. <laughs> See, Licorice thought he could bring up Hecarim and say, I can beat Aatrox as champion. Victor is the bring up here for Keen, running Klepto, as you would imagine, in a Rangers melee matchup. This is going to be exciting. I see the big advantage for Victor as I'm going through this matchup in my head. Once, especially, you get the speed boost off of your Q. But you're not going to start out with that. Uh, so maybe in the early game, we will have jungler attention up there. We'll see how Cloud9 can actually deal with this wild card, because you need to be ready for things like this in this best of five. Well, here we are on to Summoner's Rift. The last hope of South Korea versus the only hope of North America. As a freak of freaks are the last remaining South Korean team here at the World Championship. And Cloud9 represent five of six quarterfinal berths for NA since 2012. And let's see what can come through here as we get ourselves back onto Summoner's Rift for the first match of the day. 30 seconds into the minion spawn. Some insane innovation here, especially on the Afrika side. Like you mentioned, Klepto trades with the Q auto. Gonna be the big thing for Kane. Usually when you take Cassidy, you drop wave clear, you kind of sack that as something you have. But Victor Zaya, if they are grouped, can actually be fantastic wave clear in and of themselves. Also, in the early game here, LeBlanc can definitely harass Cassidy. Cassidy gains so much more power as the matchup goes on and closer to that level six. So we'll see about the early game here because uh, it is double AP solo laners with an AP jungler. That's one of the things I was cautioning against here with Kramer needing to find success. Uh, otherwise, these solo lanes of Cloud9 can just build early magic resist to protect them from both their laning opponent as well as the enemy jungler. Uh, but I think Afrika definitely ready for that. They've got that as part of the planning. Starting bottom side here for Spirit on the Gragas might actually uh, go top side to protect this victor early, which we kind of expected was the only opening that Cloud9 might try and take. And to me, that's that cautionary tale of we can think of, okay, you get the speed boost, the Q trades, the Kleptomancy mm. sounds perfect. Very, very gankable top lane champion, and Xin Zhao has that targeted ability to close the distance. No Ghost Power down, but a late ward goes down by King. And you saw Licorice at the start of the game did not leash. He instead made the wave push. He grouped up the minions and is going to force his wave to push down. So it will be under Licorice's turret, and Keen cannot stop that from happening. I'm almost very curious as well about the build that Keen decides to go for with this Victor. Uh, you can go semi-tank with Victor very easily. Um, you know, getting a shield from Seraphs, or uh, some people even going as far as Frozen Heart. Um, but we'll have to see how it does develop. If he wants to be a full AP threat or maybe a midline mage there and toe the line. And I'm sure you remember, Kobe, because in, in the NA solo queue, there was, of course, the first fleet footwork mm -hmm. and Iceborne gauntlet rush on Victor that was popular for a bit. 
earlier in the year, late last year. It's mid lane. The flash in the mid lane going for Kuro right away. He can't get away from the chain. Ignite is on. And first blood for Jensen under three minutes. The early game. That's why we caution here for Cloud9. They attack the Cassidy pre-level six. Flash is blown from Kuro. He does have teleport. So after this death, he can teleport back out. But Sven Skarin might decide to camp that. If I was him, I'd just return to the mid lane. Uh, Spirit right now has opted to go topside instead, and the junglers are going to converge. And they found the first knockup, so Keen has to outplay this one. However, there's a jungler right there. Spirit shows up. TP burning as well. They've traded on a licorice already in the top lane. And it's now Sven forced to whenever Kuro did not need to finish that TP. He has no lane to farm. Who actually comes to, I assume, finish off the kill if there was any actual attempt by Xin Zhao. There isn't. He walks down to the melee. Not a lot lost there. Nice counter gank from Spirit. Pretty brazen attempt there from Sven Skarin to go immediately from a mid lane gank into a top lane gank. And a great punishment from a freaking now on the bottom side going for mid lane trade. This keeps happening. This stun goes off on Alistair. Two send down to about 300 HP. And that is a pretty heavy trade. C9 comes out ahead. So the top lane now for Afrika Freaks looking very good. Keen even got a fork pot from his Kleptomancy, which gives him much more ape. Uh, HP as well as some AD to try and lane with and harass. Spirit now, though, is on the warpath. The junglers will not stop. This is a very aggressive game. He's going to be right behind the nice flash. Pulverize forward. Ignite is on. They're going to keep sneaky alive for a bit. Nice flash for the body slam. Beautiful play for Spirit, and the kill goes to Tucson. This game is dead even in gold right now. Both junglers firing away over and over. Now Sven Skarin reveals himself on a ward as he was trying to go back to mid lane, but this is big for bottom. And one of the big reasons you don't expect Spirit to be playing like this is Zazor wants to freeze up the minions as much as possible. Is he still doesn't have a keystone, he hasn't bought. Usually we see four cams into backing, buying boots and having your Predator online. That's two successful ganks, one a counter gank, one a proactive gank with no buy. Ooh, and they might be looking at Keen right here. The wave is slowly stacking up, and Sven Skarin's going to edge through to block out the minions. The mid laner coming up as well. Yep, they know that nobody else can make it from bottom lane in time, so he's showing early here. Keen does have flash. Let's see if he can outplay. He's going to outplay the one versus three as Jensen shows up with a little bit of mana here, and the jump is forward. Licker's going to pull aggro and Sven to deal the damage and the pull back in. Licker's going to drop aggro, a quick kill on the top side. Now Sven Skarin's on the board, two to two. So Cloud9 now overloaded three members on the top side of the map as Afrika are trying to reset. They push out bottom side as well, and this should be the first break in the game that we get. 0.4 champion kills per minute. That means on both sides for the Afrika Freaks before this, we already have four kills in five minutes. This is very much both teams adapting to expectations, I think, that were differing on both sides. Will this last the entire best of five? That's a little bit harder to see, but for game number one, action everywhere. Viewers at home that have been watching the 2018 Worlds, will be accustomed to a fairly quick pace increasing over the course of this tournament. And this one, no different. Now, we are getting to the point where Cassid in here, mid lane, Koro, is getting to his level six and will be able to actually have some agency. He is down uh, severely in CS because of the teleport that he used topside to try and protect Keen, uh, but that will change over the course of this game. Keen has been able to pick up his first evolution on that hex score. Remember, got cheaper in patches recently. We have 100 gold down early. You want to know about top lane victor and have some fun in solo queue. Here are the runes. Time Warp Tonic and Biscuiteer to get through any sort of trades in lane. And he does go for the Mana Flow Band. So basically those Q Auto trades are definitely giving him a whole lot of reward. And of course he did Max Q and Evolve Q first. So it is very much about the shield and single target damage. Less so the wave clear. Exactly what we were thinking with the speed boost. Speed so important in any Aatrox matchup to allow you to try and dodge those Q sweet spots. And remember, you can actually get the Q movement speed whether you use it on a champion or onto a minion, and you can use it twice in an escape potentially. So a lot of ability there to kite, but doesn't mean necessarily it's going to be any less susceptible to ganks when his flash is down. Yeah, the shield does also build up in scale with mana. So you mentioned the mana flow ban. He can also build into some more mana later. But currently, Cloud9 on the bottom half of the map, now turning their eyes towards this blue buff. It'll be a smite fight. It's going to be a collapse as well, a potential 4v4 as the move goes back and forth. One level lead. No, it's going to be picked up right away by Sven Skarin. Now back over the wall. This could be a bit of a fight, a stun towards the Alistair. Will they engage on a Tucson? As the Blade Color's down, they're going to jump right and forward. And the damage is going to be there. Spirit's going to drop 
one for zero, and the chase continues. Kuro over the wall. Will they chase? That answer is no, but a Grom is going to be picked up as well. Now we watch the top side as Licorice battles for the first time 1v1 against Keen. And look at the damage coming through. The Q is on for cooldown, and so Keen can re engage without those uh, blades hitting him again. Both of these top laners saving their ultimates, though. They know that everyone else was revealed on the bottom side of the map, so it's a pure 1v1. Neither of them committing too hard. And if there is a flash all in from this Aatrox on one of those Qs, not a lot of base stats behind the Victor. So a lot of mind games around the flash usage between the Aatrox and the Victor. And so we once again settle down for a little bit. An 1100 gold lead for Cloud9, including a steal on the blue buff. We can watch this 4v4 in the jungle again. All right, here's the invade. They get the blue buff. Then, after they get the stun on Tatusin, he's down to 50% HP. C9 makes the call to charge in on the three members that are separated from Kramer. No damage comes out of Zaya on that because he's across the wall. I feel like that's the sort of skirmish where if level sixes were up, it is a Freak of Freaks favorite, but Alistair can't occupy space as bot lane. Low under Kramer has the ult. He's going to dodge away for a little bit, but a jump forward's going to mean the first time the knock up and another kill. Four to two, Cloud9. Lightning quick pace in this game. Ben Scarin has been a monster. Gank after gank after gank in Cloud9 running the early game now. The degree of difficulty of disengaging a gank when it's so much targeted CC and auto attacks with a Braum means basically the first CC skill lands, someone dies. Oh, keep your eyes open though, folks, because Spirit on the Grog has just went he's for He's not six! Tucson's really low, this could be a dive and a kill, and he's got him! Sneaky, a solo kill under the turret! Sneaky Lucian is able to get the 1v1 on the level five support. I don't know if Tucson's cooldown on Flash was about to come up, that looked very close. They're gonna look at the mid lane now again. Kuro has flashed this time, gets away from it. Ignite is there. They play in the chain. One more auto. That should be it with he Ignite. Got it. And he takes them down. Solo kills all over the place for Cloud9. Big moments for Cloud9. This is feeling more and more like a Freak of Freaks in the first three games before they got things together. This is not the slow pace they used to. And in trying to catch up and keep tempo with Cloud9, they're dying left, right, and center. A Freak of Freaks come out with the planning and the lane swap here for a Victor coming to the top side into the Aatrox matchup, but Cloud9 come out with pure brutality, gank after gank after gank, and they are finding the kills. And this is the time they need to prosper because scaling-wise, a lot to like about a Freak of Freaks the game goes on, specifically the Lucian, the LeBlanc, so strong early to mid game, don't necessarily fall away, but you would say a Freak of favored with the Cassidy in the late game, yet, at this point, it's the better part of a 3,000 gold lead for C9. And in addition, the Kassadin being held to 50 CS at 10 minutes here. That is absolute denial from the mid lane, Jensen. Because, indeed, there was also a mid lane gank at level 2. There was also Kuro then afterwards using his teleport to the top lane. But if you give Jensen an opening like that, over and over, we have seen this player, even on the world stage, absolutely demolish opponents. And his stats certainly back it up. Second round, Robin, those 3 0 into 3 1 scoreline for Cloud9 on the day. His CSD goes up the better part of 16. Gonna go up way more with this game, including that sample size. Cloud9, they're not done. We're looking around two under the turret right here. They got a slow one to Kramer. Kramer does still have his summoners. A big stun to the front line. Turn it back forward into the dive. They go, but Kramer stays alive, and here comes the teleports as the reinforcements have arrived. And Freak and Freak's gonna push. C9 right back out of that one. See if they get a full retreat here. They have been able to do it. Cloud9 also setting up another counter. Now they're going to find a slow bit on the spear, but watch out for the rest of this one. It's still four strong, and Afrika could turn the corner. However, it's C9 keeping them stuck inside this turret area. Yeah, look at the harassment. Chunks in the health bar on Afrika Freak side, but no answer. All Cloud9 members still healthy, and that will allow them the objective. They're playing bottom side, controlling that area, and the Cassidy is not battle ready yet, with basically no items. He's only got the catalyst and a bit of magic resist. So given that, at the top of the map, we were seeing Keen finally out trade Licorice and keep him a bit more accountable under lane. But definitely bot side, the Drake is free and the turret dies. They will be repeated again and again by Cloud9. And honestly, it should just be the turret take right now for Cloud9. They have got so much pressure on bottom side that Afrika Freak Freaks have already swapped their dual lane up to the top side. Licorice, though, could be punished if he goes aggressive now. Pop his ult to not get one shot. In fact, he will get the ulti turned off. and. 
He'll revive with about 400, 500 health right there. And staying alive, nice getting away by Jensen there. His body slam flash came through, but did not land the target. That's a great explosive cast, though. Jensen needs the cooldowns back, does get over the wall, stays alive through a flash and an ultimate. And Jensen holds on to his own flash. Spirit using everything he has in his arsenal there, and yet unable to get any meaningful cooldowns. Top side of Freak of Freaks will answer with a turret of their own, trying to get some gold back for themselves. Gonna wave this one as far as possible. Braum is walking up, but Lucian was still, of course, in the bot lane. So, the, yes, as you mentioned, Kobe, given the scenario with ultimates down on Tucson and Kramer. No local gold. I think they were afraid of Lucian being there as well. Yeah. So half the value of that turret just disappeared. 250 only for that turret kill. Yep, you have to stay within range of the turret going down. At least one member of the team or the gold just goes into the ground. All right, let's check in with Keen's item build. He has two evolves onto the Hex score. The Sheen might signal the Ice One Gold that we were alluding to earlier. I don't think Trinity Force Victor is coming out of this game, so <laughs> given that- could be good too. Bank could be good too, you're right. Yeah, we'll see what comes through into that one. Either way, though, he's certainly going for the 1v1 focus build. That makes sense for Keen. Here he's going to try to kite around through Licorice as he's jumping back four, but Licorice has a long way to go to get back to his base, and Keen is fast. Forcing the flash over the wall, Licorice having to run away. Yeah, good use of the speed boost here on display from Keen. Constant harassment with the Sheen procs over and over. That's what they were thinking with this entire setup of Champion Select. But will it be enough to get them back into this game? It's definitely a tables of turn moment for Licorice because he's usually on the side of the matchup that he knows better. Hecarim into Aatrox is always going to favor the Hecarim player. When you go for this off-meta pick, when you innovate, you always have an experience advantage. So nice to see, even though it hasn't really translated into too much for Keen just yet. Well, either way, I do really appreciate the mid-game plays of Afrika Freaks. They were losing in so many of their lanes, especially that bot lane two on two, and they've managed to make turret trade after turret trade, top for bot, now bot for top as well. The question is, though, if mid lane tier two gets taken down, then they've maybe bitten off more than they can chew. Another trade on the mid side, forcing a flash away. Whoa. Otherwise, it was an equal trade of turrets. Jensen has full run of this lane. Kuro has nowhere safe to go. Sneaky takes wow. down another turret on top side for Cloud9, and the territory for a Freak of Freak continues to shrink. And it also doesn't really play into what we were expecting. The Kassadin last pick, because Kassadin's seen as a containment matchup where you go decent against the ball. You're not going to win, but your trades are usually pretty good with Q. Has gone way off script. It's an insane lead, 62 CS at 14 minutes. And countdown to one largest CSD at 15 of Worlds this year. This has been the most lopsided mid lane matchup in farm. And meanwhile, Kramer having to run away, has a blast on for that one, but he brings Sinja with him. The dive forward, the knock up onto the both of them. That's gonna be one kill picked up and the stun under the turret. Tushin will get away. We have seen some quick games here at Worlds, but Cloud9 are absolutely making a good case for themselves. In game number one, of this quarterfinal matchup. Zazel and Sneaky will be able to get out. Rift Herald has been used. They want to get the last outer turret. There's no reason to give Afrika Freaks any lifelines. You want to keep pushing. You want to keep pressuring. Ensure this game ends before Kassadin has 200 CS, before Afrika Freaks as a team has 40,000 gold. They're at 22,000 now. And the one item, two item power spikes are all favored to C9. Things looking good for the third straight upset in the quarterfinals. Yesterday, both of the lower seeds won their matchup. C9, the lower seed here today. Afrika Freaks chose red to go for champ select antics. We see that with the victor top. And though the matchup has looked good for Keen, it's been the bot lane two on two, the jungle matchup, the mid lane matchup that have gone that have been going Cloud9's way here has looked for more ways to advantage themselves in this mid-game. Alright, we need to put ourselves in Afrika Freak's shoes and try and find a way out of this disastrous early game. First, we'll go through this replay, though, uh, and it's going to be a rough one for Kramer as uh, he's able to use his ultimate, and they do get the Blast Zone, getting some distance. But Zazel, no hesitation, flash in with Braum to finish off the kill onto the marks. All summoners are up because there's been no pressure on C9 to use them defensively and use them offensively for kills. To begin your point though, Kobe, I think what we always talk about in these defensive macro situations where you look at your team and say, okay, right now we're a bit like paper. We're definitely a bit susceptible. We like our scaling is getting as much of a defensive control ward line as possible and then trying to grow it. Right now, maybe it's too risky to take your Raptors so you put your control wards a bit more shallow. But as you find more and more space on the map, you push them up and you try not to give away Baron, which 
fortunately for Afrika, has not spawned yet. Exactly. Another bonus of this pick. Oh, here we go. That's a huge one. 3v3 in the mid lane. A lot of damage in the Zazel. Trade it back now to Tucson as well. And now here comes the evisceration as it's Fensker and Force run away. Gets a knock. I'm still trying to kite. He's not going down just yet. They get the trade kill. It's actually Kuro going down one for zero as Fen will not burn down. Kuro just did no damage at all to the Xinjiao. His Rod of Ages has to stack. He's nowhere on the map, and Afrika find nothing from a big investment. That's the problem with this theory. Cassidy can outscale LeBlanc if given equal income, but he has not been allowed any gold in this game. Absolutely held to scraps. And with those scraps, he cannot fight back. Blue buff now under contest. Ooh, one hit away from stunning Keen. He's not gonna hit just yet. Now in comes Jensen, but has to come right back out. That was a potential stun out of Victor. Blue buff steal still happens. Infernal break alive, and Svenskeren easily solos that one. And Cloud9 grow their lead to 7,000 plus two Drakes. Yeah, we have seen very clearly here, name of the game has to be defense for a freak of freaks if they want any hope of coming back in this opening game. But they keep trying to make a proactive defense by trying to find fights and just don't have the damage behind them to pull it off. A ward at the Gromp is the only siding ward, and Keen has no idea that his life is vacant. He had a flash, burns it there, and now he's running away, but the knockups are in, so there might not be the way out. The stun's gonna land, pulled right back, and another kill, his third, Sven Skerritt. An ominous vision toggle there by the observers. Well done, as it really conveys the story of how scary it is to play from the Afrika Freak side right now. Cloud9 is a war machine and they are not on stopping. And you have to make these kind of poor swaps here for Afrika and say, Keen, you take the risky assignment, at least Kuro will get some farm topside while your life is very much in peril. It feels bad, it definitely doesn't allow Afrika any real movement on the gold numbers, which are still gonna be heavily Cloud9 favored. But this game is really now at the point where Afrika are at the whims of Cloud9. And if Cloud9 make the right proactive calls, Afrika don't actually have the weaponry to contest a war. Well, it's going to take some time for Afrika to come back. Thankfully for them, of course, it is a best of five. You can drop a game and still come back. We've seen every series so far at Worlds go the full distance here in the quarterfinals. And today might be no different no matter what game one may look like. Baron coming up in 23 seconds. That is surely going to be on C9's menu here as they put the wards down on the river. Completely different story here in the best of five. Adaptation is so big. The window's still definitely open, and still C9 do need to close this loop. Baron hasn't even spawned yet. They do have complete control. They should be able to set up the vision in this red quadrant and allow them uh, fairly easy use of this objective. However, you still have to take those steps, especially in a series like this. Yeah, the defensive setup will continue for Afrika. As we were talking about when it comes to vision lines, it can't even control that Raptor brush. At present, Van Scaren in the most advanced brush on top side. You have to be disrespectful when Cloud9 have basically won eight out of nine early skirmishes, and there have been plenty of early skirmishes. Afrika set up, though, and even a catch to relieve pressure will be big, but every time they've attempted that, they've been repelled super well by Cloud9. Worlds just continually going down. They can't see much more than just the very beginning of the outside of their base as top is pushed in. C9 moves back into mid here, trying to push the people away, but there's a head of pulverize in, and the fight continues now on the front side in front of tier two. Bolt comes in for Keen as well, and Cloud9 gonna disengage, but send a few back forward and knock down Tucson, one for zero. Explosive cast brings in, and that's gonna be one kill picked up, a one for one so far. The revival coming out soon for Licorice, but it's already Keen dropping as C9 are up two to one in this team fight. They can walk right back away easily. Yeah, the objective doesn't go down. The turret Ooh. still stands, but Jensen's not done. He wants to chunk down, and he does! Takes out Kramer, three to one in the team fight, and that turret's gonna fall as well. Individual moments like that are game breakers when this game is really, really in the advantage of C9. Jensen gets the individual outplay to just put that exclamation point on another positive trade for C9. Jensen has been a player criticized for big moments in the North American LCS. But here in the world stage, we're gonna get another look at this play from Cloud9. Watch the replay here as it goes through. Tucson tries once again to be proactive. The issue is that even through his ultimate, he's not tanky enough, and there's not enough, there's not two item spikes on anyone on the side of Afrika. Yeah, this is clearly Cloud9 with the giant gold advantage. Flickerick does teleport it in and finish off Keen here, then popping the revive off of the blade caller. As you know, this is not over. And there is more to this replay. Jensen yep. on the side, able to find Kramer. He knows Look, that the Kramer chain. has yeah. no cooldowns left. Now the chain, 
That does look crazy when LeBlanc goes back to different spots on the map, but the chain goes straight from where you shot it. So as he knows in his heart, as soon as he shoots it, point blank range, right into the Zaya, that thing's gonna land no matter where he goes. That was definitely a bend it like Jensen <laughs> moment because that was uh, very impressive. Look at the top here. Following on with the Freak stat earlier, this is uh, C9 really fully rampaging through Afrika. Mental reset is not usually a word we use for game number two of a best of five, but already it has to be something to levy out of Freak of Freaks, given how dominant C9 have been. Ben Garrett going for a face check. One versus two, knocks him back, has a blast cone, gets away. And Cloud9 causing North American fans to dare to hope. This story of Cloud9 this year is absolutely amazing. This team subbing out star players in the summer split, falling to 10th place in the North American LCS and have fought their way hurdle after hurdle, problem after problem, all the way to the quarterfinals here at Worlds. And with this improvement that we have seen at each stage, they don't look like they're gonna stop anytime soon. The team that dares to dream biggest at Worlds has largely prospered. C9 looking for a couple of picks to break the base. Jensen goes a nice job getting away from the headbutt pole for us. Cool down for about eight seconds there for Tucson, but that won't be an opening for Cloud9 just yet. They're just gonna push in this lane, but they are still setting up around this Baron. You know they can. You know a team's being suffocated where four members have actually switched over to the blue trinket just to spot a brush because they know they can't stick control wards even outside their base at any moment. They need as much spot vision as possible with Baron on the menu very soon. All right, looks like we may have another fight over Vision. Kuro does Rift Walk out, though, before Cloud9 can close the loop. We do have a Predator activation, but I don't think they want any fight. Yeah, there'll be a couple of ward kills here as Cloud9 knocks down the few that were able to be put down from the uh, Sight Stone there. But Blasco means it's C9 into the Baron pit, and they're going to try right now, leaving Zazel and Jensen to zone out the squad as two of them knock down Baron. Important that Jensen already has a Banshee's Veil completion here on the LeBlanc providing him immunity when he goes for harassment. We'll see if a Freak of Freaks can get in there. Baron, though, gonna regenerate as they have to pull off with only two members starting it. When Tucson has to lose the ultimate as three, the blue triggers were used trying to spot out Baron. Now they're not gonna land, but only onto the tank if member of the team. Will they burn him down? A great cast pulls him back, but so does the W from Licorice. And another kill comes in for Cloud9, 13 to three, and once again, they can turn to Baron. Double chains here, Licorice and Jensen both ensuring that Tucson will go down and now Cloud9 can return to the objective. The cost of a freaking going for these three blue trinkets, they only have one sweeper, he's dead, and thus they have no idea if C9 know where they're at. How much can a freaky be pushed away from this one? The is getting a little bit lower, but look oh! at that explosion! Kino's already dead, he only built armor, and Baron is a formality, 14 to three, a 12,000 gold lead, and Cloud9 can look at the base now. You gotta love it when a plan comes together, even though Afrika's best hopes were at spotting that Baron HP. It didn't matter in the end. C9 were happy to see them come to them, and now with the Baron buff, they just wanna wreck the base on this first Baron buff push. Cloud9 starting to go Super Saiyan here over the course of Worlds, 25 minutes in, they've got Baron buff, and they are looking to finish the Afrika Freaks. And they're gonna look at it right now as the inhibitor is under fire. There will not be a defense, a good ult for Kramer. Gets away from an assassination that had happened five minutes ago, but the base is still falling. Top and hip is gone, the middle gonna lose its turret on top of this one, so C9, when do they get stopped? It's almost certainly not in this game. 26 minutes in, they're looking at the Nexus turrets already, but first, a quick reset to buy with their thousands of gold in inventory and take that one last death blow. Now, best of five is truly a marathon, but the first leg of the marathon is definitely going in the favor of Cloud9, and we start to think about the adaptations and what they will be going to game number two. As we watch uh, Jensen here on the LeBlanc going for pure harassment, Zazel and Licorice just keep up the chase. Even through the extra damage reduction of the Alistar ultimate, they know as long as they pull him back, they will be able to finish off the kill. Now, the problem with your metaphor is that I would want to call this a sprint, but it's more like Cloud9 was sprinting and Afrika Freaks had a medical emergency it had to pull out because this game has been decided very early in it. Hard to say what the comms are, but the moment you're seeing Jensen nuke four out of five members of the Afrika Freaks, they had to know their chances were slim. Another Drake is added to the pile. It may not be a perfect game, but three kills and two of the turrets is all Afrika Freaks have to show from game number one. So this should be C9 closing it out here as they send their members back across the map, most of them now to the bottom lane to push in for the last bit. 
For so long, the state of League of Legends has been largely based around team fighting and five on five. But as we've drawn closer and closer to Worlds, with these small changes to the rules of the game, it has really favored those taking early moves in the game, those looking for individual outplays. And now Cloud9, they're looking to finish this first game. 27-30 in bot lane being sieged by Jensen. The rest of the team in the mid lane. Nice look back. And they might make down Sneaky, and they will. One for zero. This will be the last stand for Afrika as they dive into the back lane. But Jensen's already picked off the marksman down there. Kuro's got to pop his Zonia's hourglass. Tucson is going to drop as well. Turn to the ground beef. And the chase continues with three surviving members. But there's minions inside the base, and their trade kills are coming through. The minions as six men might just be enough. Afrika trying to survive, but their base can't run away. It can't heal and the attacks come through and the three surviving members of cloud nine will take game one powerful opener here from the cloud nine squad and Afrika freaks are left to adjust already turning their eyes towards game number two I like the adjustment they attempted. They were trying to be tricky in the draft. The victor side of the coin was actually quite strong. Issue is, the last pick Gambit was the Cassidy, and he fell too far behind after that first initial gank. So it felt like the fallbacks for this innovative strategy were not adequate, and other little issues meant that Cloud9 really steamrolled Afrika in game number one. Cloud9 have shown that every member of their team is a threat, and even if you are able to construct this counter pick for topside to deal with Licorice. Jensen just goes wild. Well, Cloud9 clearly better in for the five rolls and maybe closer to a wash on the top lane. Either way, to hear more about that C9 victory, let's send it over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you, Freak. C9 out the gates hot with a victory over Afrika Freaks, and it was a dominant one at that. From minute zero to game close, there was action upon action. Before we get into the gameplay, I do want to look at this draft, though, because we talked about coming into, the, coming into the day, C9, the innovators. They're the ones who are playing the Hecarims, the Zillions, and what would the response be out of Afrika? Not to be outdone, Afrika says, we can innovate ourselves, and they pull out the victor top in response to the Aatrox. I will say innovation also comes with a high amount of risk. Yes, it uh, does. It's actually, as they mentioned, the Cassidy that was the failure of innovation here, because I actually am terrified of the top lane victor throughout the rest of this series. I thought it was a good pick into Aatrox. Overall in this draft, Cloud9 went all in on the early game, and they, they scored. They got it. And I want to double down on that casting point, because I agree. Because while you look at Afrika, they went for that controlled style. They went for the late game. You see all of these scaling options. By having the casting in there and by having Victor go a Q max, you don't have a ton of wave clear options there, mm -hmm. uh, especially not with all of the dive threat and potential onto a Zaya. Uh, so you're basically looking at the combined wave clear of like Gragas and Zaya. So you see a full early game draft. You know that you're scaling. You don't have any wave clear. And wave clear is like the crux of if you fall behind and maybe they get a Baron, hey, at least we have that Orion in the mid lane or some sort of mm -hmm. big wave clear that we could just stall out. Without any stall options, Afrika literally just got steamrolled. That was like a 10K gold advantage at like 22 minutes in the game. But I think what Afrika were expecting was not this Cloud9. Like when you look at how they- This was a Cloud9 in Group B? Yeah, but to me, like the fact that Sneaky and Zazel were a bot lane that were not finding 2v2 kills, that they prioritized things like Zaya and were losing lane. They went on Kaisa and would just gracefully fall behind. The fact that he drafts Lucian Braum and then they dumpster them in the two versus two, I really don't think that Afrika were expecting this bot lane to show up like they did. For me, my issue is that I didn't expect this Afrika in a best of five, and now I'm just ready to sail ship. Right, I, I can see logic if Afrika believes the, the, the victor wins, as we kind of saw it do in the isolated 1v1, and believing that their 2v2 bot lane would win. Of course, that not being the case, the map fell apart very quickly for that squad. Yeah, it certainly did. And I loved the way in which the victor came out. We did see the runes in game and just on your screen. I think that we were mm -hmm. talking behind the scenes about how it worked and how in the 1v1 match it was actually holding its own, but that didn't really matter when Cloud9 were just forcing plays all across the board. Yeah, Jensen actually got the cast in flash before the gank, which is why the gank then worked. But I have to credit Spirit actually for a really clever early game. Almost 
almost every Predator Gragas clears three camps, goes boots, and buys Predator, but Spirit pulled both of these ganks off pre-Predator, which is why C9 was positioned so aggressively in the lane. However, the controlled style of Afrika Freaks went very quickly out the window when Cloud9 consistently forced plays on the map. Yeah, and Cloud9 making excellent cross-map plays, as well as the fact that they capitalize on all the poor individual decisions from Afrika. Why were they even trying to fight that blue? You have a scaling composition, and you're literally dying 1v1 in mid, 1v1 in bot, getting dove up into the top side. There was no reason to approach that. And then Tucson, it just ties into what you're talking about with terms of individual mistakes for us. There were a number of them on the side of Afrika, and it just kind of was made even oh. worse given the fact that C9 was just playing so well across the board. I feel like press F to pay respects to Korea. This was like mental boom on every position, save for the jungle. I mean, it didn't. It didn't look pretty, right? And that's why I got <laughs> it. was brutal. <laughs> but, 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 but the fact that it does come down to just maybe a few individual mistakes is actually why I'm not ready to say it's all over for Afrika just yeah. yet, I mean, right? Dash, Korea has won the last five world championships. Uh, how, misfits last year didn't take an SKT. Cloud9 lost games four and five against yeah. MWE last year. I've gotten excited many, many times <laughs> for This is my point, Frost. You're, yeah, so yeah, yeah. you're so ready to disavow <laughs> Afrika. <laughs> they, it's only one game. That is two NA guys. And like... I did pick C9 on the series, but <laughs> I am true. not getting excited yet. That was, in yet. A, that was a very good game one mm -hmm. with a very well executed early game draft. I agree. And it can just be that. No. Like, we can just wait <laughs> until it has Right, it. exactly. Uh, Vedius, one of your concerns uh, around Cloud9 was, was the fact that they're prone to make mistakes or yes. overreach, maybe push a little too far uh, where they shouldn't. And so my question to you is, what, if anything, did this game one do to maybe alleviate some of those fears around Cloud9 in this best of five? Well, after they got all those early kills and early advantages, I was looking at how they closed the game out. And in particular, how they set it for the Baron. And when we look at how they actually set this play up, one of the cool things that they recognize is they don't have a frontline tank. So as you notice, as they started off, they have to peel away because as a two-man, they can't actually clear this one out. Instead, what they need to do is find control in the enemy jungle and look for a pick. That's why they so hard commit onto Tucson, one of the primary engage tools from the side of Afrika. So after finding this pick, they go back, but again, they keep Jensen in the jungle because what they yeah. need to to do is have this threat, have this pick potential ready, because this comp, even though they're this far ahead, they don't want to run the risk of going for that 5v5. They're much better off just using the individual goal lead to find these kind of punishes. And this was, with the composition that they had, the perfect Baron setup. And for yeah. me, this gives me so much more confidence to this Cloud9 squad. But yet you keep saying not to just override on Cloud9. I'm seeing yeah. individual mistakes from Afrika. I'm seeing wonky drafts from Afrika. True. Great Baron setup from Cloud9 and individual clutch pop-offs from Cloud9. But we saw those from G2 yesterday in game two, and then game three, they Who got whitewashed <laughs> by RNG. But my point is that while this is great from Cloud9, something you said at the beginning of the day was consistency. Yep. And for Cloud9, that is something that they found mm -hmm. at parts during the regular season, but they ended up getting 3 0 in the final. And while they look good right now, and right. I am optimistic and I am confident and I am happy for North America, <laughs> I am not yet ready. It doesn't sound like you're happy. I'm not yeah. yet ready to jump on the Cloud9. I'm not that convinced way. either just yet. I'm going to wait for the rest of the games to play out. MasterCard player of the game is going to Jensen on that LeBlanc pick. Rather, as you said, Jat from level one, level two, blowing that flash to get the snowball rolling. Yeah, I think Sneaky and Zazel played a great game. I think Sven Skarin had solid ganks, but this was a vintage Jensen bodying of fools. Yes, it uh, was. Because after he got that first gank kill that he burned the flash on, he never relented. That was, that's at least two solo kills. I think he had three solo kills in this game on the block. Something and like that. Just a menace throughout the whole game. And, and Jensen is so much one of those players where it matters about how he is feeling on that day. And he will play to, you know, uh, to that feeling. It can be bad, it can be good. And today it seems like he's feeling it. These EU mids, man, what can we say? Like, uh, uh, let, us, <laughs> let us have this, Benius. Nah, he has let never us. played in EU <laughs> six You had to throw it in there, but uh, props to Jensen. He had a fantastic performance. My eyes are on him to be a big carry in this series. Very much so. Game one is in the book. C9 kicks off the quarterfinals with a win. We'll see what Afrika Freaks has prepared for game two when we return.
mid lane. The flash in the mid lane going for Kuro right away. He can't get away from the chain. Ignite is on. And first blood for Jensen under three minutes. Nice flash for the body slam. Beautiful play for Spirit. Spirit on the grog. It's just went He's for not six. Two six really low. This could be a dive and a kill. And he's got him. Look at the mid lane now again. Kuro has flash this time. Gets away from it. Ignite is there. He's laying the chain. One more auto. That should be with Ignite. And he takes him down. He's back. He's back. Coming he's down. Fighting. Coming down. I'm coming he's down. Fighting. He's coming down for the fight. I'm behind. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yep. I'm here. Good shit. I'm sweeping here. Great this mission. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. I'm gonna take turret. How much can a freaky be pushed away from this one? Help us getting a little bit lower. But look oh. at that explosion. Kino's already dead. Afrika tried to survive, but their base can't run away. It can't heal, and the attacks come through. And the three surviving members of Cloud Nine will take Game One. The synergy of brute strength, born of elite core power to thrive under pressure in the most hostile conditions and build to overclock. Prepare for combat. Go forth and conquer.